All right, and we're going live on YouTube. And while that happens, for our attendees, I'd love if you all could put in the chat, maybe um, if you're part of the Citizen Science Club, that'd be really cool to know. Um, if there's something you're particularly interested in learning today, that too. Um, just kind of whatever you all want to cover, we are here for you to cover it. So everybody, please um, say hello in the chat and select all panelists and attendees. That's really helpful to us. So your peers can, you know, join in the conversation. I'm also going to put the link to this live stream in the chat. So we are recording, we are streaming live to YouTube. And this event will be available on the SciStarter NCSU page afterward. Um, so if you all want to share it with other members of the Citizen Science Club or other students in North Carolina or other members of the North Carolina community, maybe your family, your friends, etc. Uh, this NCSU homepage is open to you and a place where you can get resources. Um, so while people are saying hello in the chat and getting their, their greetings in, I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, I'm Caroline Nickerson. I'm with the SciStarter team. Um, I get to join you all every week at 6 o'clock Eastern time for Making It Count Monday um, with NCSU and soon with NCANT, another school in the North Carolina area. Um, I get to do all sorts of different things at SciStarter, everything from working with libraries to working with our corporate volunteer programs to Girl Scouts and everything in between. Um, and my favorite part of my day is when I get to do citizen science. So I'm really looking forward to doing some stall catchers tonight. I'll pass the mic to Deja to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Making It Count Monday. Um, it's our second week, and I'm so excited that you guys are here with us today. Uh, my name is Deja Perkins, and I am the second half of our co-hosting team. I am an urban ecologist and science communicator, currently working um, with the NCSU Craft the Tap program, um, one of SciStar's featured projects. If you are interested in participating or want to know more, feel free to reach out with us. Um, so excited about our lineup and our program today. And I hope that you guys um, enjoy today. Awesome, I'll let Pietro quickly introduce himself. I know you're gonna get more time later, Pietro, to talk about stall catchers and the work you do, but just really quickly, if you could say hi to the crowd. Hi crowd. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's great to be here. Uh, no, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be <clears throat> part of this. Uh, I, I realize this is a new program that you're getting, getting started here. And uh, I love to talk about science uh, and any topics anyone's interested in. My background's cognitive science and, uh, and I helped start a citizen science project called Stall Catchers. So I look forward to talking with you about that. Awesome stuff. Um, someone said, I'm from the Citizen Science Club at NC State. I'm excited to talk about the impact these pro participating in these projects can have. That's fantastic. And I actually am going to do one quick formal poll. I want to see how many people are part of the NC State community. So get your answers in really quickly. Yes, no, unsure. Any answers are fine. It looks like about a 50-50 split. About half of you are part of the NC State community and half of you aren't. Good to know. I'm going to end that poll and share my results really quickly. Um, okay, and let's do another quick poll. So we want to know, do you live in North Carolina? Because I mean, stall catchers is a global project. You can live pretty much anywhere and be part of it. But oh my gosh, we have um, four people do, two people don't, and one person is not sure. Good to know. I'm going to end that poll and share my results. And then we have one more poll. Um, for those of you who are part of the NC State community, are you part of the Citizen Science Club? I know one of you are. Um, are. I see someone in the chat saying that they were. Two no's, one yes. Oh my gosh, an an another unsure. I, I wonder if that's the same person who wasn't sure if they lived in North Carolina or not. Well, that's okay. All are welcome here. You don't have to be sure of anything to do citizen science. So we'll end the poll there and share those results. Um, cool, cool, cool. So to kick things off, we usually start with those polls. And then um, I um, will just really quickly give you all an overview of the NC State page. And then I'm going to pass the mic to Deja to talk about um, the societal connections and give an introduction to our event today. So let me share my screen. 
So this is the NC State page, scistar.org forward slash NCSU dash home. I'll put this in the chat too, so you all can um, make follow along with me. Maybe if you don't have a SciStarter account, just quickly doing that. I'll share my screen again. Um, so this is the page and we'll go over it in more detail after Dage's intro, but you can basically RSVP for other instances of making it count Monday. We have a whole season lineup here. You can do a Citizen Science Month tutorial. I mean, not Citizen Science Month, Citizen Science tutorial. And then there are some featured projects here. Um, soon we're adding stall catchers to the page as well. Um, and all other sorts of things like recordings of past events of making it count Mondays. Today's recording will also be added here and um, all sorts of other things that we'll leave you to explore and we'll go into more detail later. But otherwise, I'm going to mute myself and let Deja speak. Um, we should have it in speaker view. So um, Deja, when you talk, I think you're going to be the main focus camera. OK, great. So what are we talking about today? It's still October, so I thought we would keep with um, a little bit of the spookiness, a little bit of the creepy theme. Um, this week, we are going to be talking about the brain. Um, it is the organ that holds our entire life. I don't know about you, um, but the brain is a fascinating yet potentially terrifying organ, you know, from the zombies that eat them to the serial killers and the crazy people whose brains have caused them to commit some atrocious acts. Um, from brains are in one shape or form, the feature of a lot of scary movies. Um, and the fact that this organ is the thing that holds our entire life, holds the ability to think, to reason, to feel emotion, to hold memories, and to move our bodies. It only weighs three pounds. That is three pounds of remarkable matter. You matter, guys, you matter. Um, nearly 60% of the human brain is made of fat. So not only is it the fattiest organ in the human body, but unlike some other fats, um, the fatty acids in our brain are crucial for our brain's performance. Our brain uses 20% of the oxygen and blood in our body which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, it's also made of 75% water. So make sure that you drink your water, everybody. It's um, recommended that we drink eight ounces, um, I'm sorry, eight, eight ounce glasses, which is two liters or half gallon, um, whatever you fancy. Uh, for me, I choose to drink two of these huge bottles, uh, two or three of these uh, 40 ounce town metal water bottles. And while this is not an ad, why not do something for the environment while you do something for your body? Um, now back to the brain. Speaking of things that go in our body that affect our brains, alcohol affects our brain. Um, it affects our brains in ways that include blurred vision, uh, slurring our speaking, having an unsteady walk, our coordination is off, um, and so much more. And so these usually disappear once we become sober again. Um, but if you drink for long periods of time, there is evidence that alcohol can affect your brain permanently and not reverse once you become sober again, uh, which is a very scary thought. And so some of that long-term um, effects of alcohol um, on the brain include memory issues and some reduced cognitive function. And so we also think about things that we ingest that affect the body. Um, let's talk about brain freezes, okay? Um, I know that uh, drinking cold water, anything with ice, how about ices and Slurpees at the movies, um, drinking them too fast can cause a brain freeze. Um, it's really called, I'm about to butcher this, so don't laugh at me. It's called sphenopalatine and ganglial neuralgia. I'm pretty sure I slaughtered that, but um, if anybody knows how to pronounce that, let me know in the chat. Um, it happens when something we eat or drink is really cold and it chills our blood vessels and our arteries in the very back of the throat, including the ones that take the blood to our brain. And so these constrict and so they get tighter um, when they're cold and open back up when they're warm again. And so this constricting is what's causing the pain in our foreheads crazy, right? 
But let's forget freezing our brain. What about speed? The brain travels, uh, information in the brain can travel up to 268 miles per hour, which is faster than the fastest animal on the planet, the peregrine falcon, um, which travels up to 240 miles per hour. Of course, you all know I had to include some type of animal fact in there, seeing as I am an urban ecologist and the peregrine falcon is one of our urban birds. Um, so thinking about speed, um, at what point do uh, you know our brains start to lose that ability um, to recall? The human brain um, starts to lose some of its memory capabilities and some cognitive still skills um, by our late twenties. Who, who knew? Like. Ooh, I'm getting up there in age, you guys, I'm, I'm a little concerned. Um, and, and speaking about brain growth and memory, um, our brain does a lot of growing in that first year of life. It actually triples in size during that age. And the human brain actually gets smaller as we get older. So if you're having some memory problems, don't worry, it's probably normal. Um, and this usually happens sometime after middle age. Now, how can we potentially improve some of our cognitive abilities? Um, video games, computer games, hello. Um, who knew that those things that our you know, parents and grandparents told us would rot our brain um, actually can potentially help our brain. Um, so some studies are being conducted to learn about what type of games help. And we are going to be talking today about a game that will not only help our brains, but help some other people's brains. Um, so, you know, how can we talk about the brain without talking about memory? So you should be impressed by your brain's ability to perceive the world and generate thoughts. Um, like we said, the brain is that organ that essentially holds our entire life, which is fascinating. Um, but memory is just as amazing. Um, it's estimated that our brains can store 2,500,000 gigabytes of information, which is mind-blowing. Um, so you have two basic types of memory. Um, you have short-term memory and you have long-term memory. Our short-term memory is um, it's what can be referred to as our working memory. It's basically the memory that allows us to remember information long enough for us to use it. So think about when you know somebody tells you a phone number and you dial it, um, but you might forget it right after the call ends. Um, for me, it takes me a few times still repeating that number for me to remember what the number even is long enough to dial it. Um, don't know if that's normal, fingers crossed that it is. Um, and you would think that pulling up memory is kind of like pulling a file from a folder, you know, like our brain is this organ and thinking about having like one of those huge file cabinets with all the memories of our life. And you would think it would be easy as pulling a file from a folder, but it isn't. Your brain has to recreate and reimagine that memory. And it's not a perfect copy of the original um, or the first time you had that memory. And our ability to look up any of the information in the world is great for everything except memory. And our brain isn't lazy. Um, it's just busy, you know, like the rest of us, you know, just responsible for controlling the rest of our bodies and our lives. No biggie. And so, you know, because it's so busy, it prioritizes tasks that absolutely need to be done. So um, if it knows you can look something up again, your brain may not store that little tidbit of information. I, you know, being a scientist, am curious as to how our brain knows what's something that can be looked up again. How do you know, brain? How do you know that what I'm what I'm looking at right now or what I need to remember isn't something that I can can or cannot look up again? You know, how do you know that? So um, thinking about memory, how do we recall? Thinking about you know forming and recalling memory, pictures are the perfect tools for memory. Studies have shown that people retain 65% of information when images are involved. What I didn't know, being an anosmic, uh, meaning I don't have a sense of smell, is that many people say their sense of smell is closely tied to a memory. Does anybody in the audience have a smell um, or a scent that they closely tie to a memory? If so, please drop it in the chat really quick um, so we can think about it, so we can talk about it. Um, and while we wait, I'll ask 
Caroline, do you have a scent or other scents that you I was about to unmute my mic and let you know. I keep on, I'm trying to think of not the basic ones that you always think of, like a grandmother's perfume or something like that. Um, I think since we are like entering fall and even my limited Floridian version of fall, um, th like smelling a campfire makes me think of like fun times as a kid. Very, very cool. That is, that is so cool. It's something I didn't, I never thought about. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a sense of smell. So for me, images are how I recall things. Um, and so for me, I keep, um, I keep a lot of photos and whenever people send like birthday cards or get well cards, I keep them because um, just reading, rereading the words or looking at the pictures, they just really bring back fond memories of that person or exactly when that memory happened. So I'm looking, trying to pull up the chat. One nice thing that um, Zoom does that WebEx doesn't do is, um, this is a quick aside, but I didn't know, realize this, but WebEx had added a feature where if people don't have your video up, they'll put an exclamation point by their name to call them out. But Zoom doesn't do that, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know you all, you might be listening and like scrambling to find the Zoom window again, but let us know if there's a scent that makes you think of a certain thing um if there's like if there are any questions you all have about how the brain works i think stall catchers is so cool because um and pietro i think can elaborate on this more in his presentation but i know there are some people who play stall catchers as a mentally stimulating game for themselves you know just like to have fun with it while they're also solving problems or getting more information or discovering things about the brain someone said play-doh is a scent i love that i can i can like smell that in my brain just the, reading the word play-doh uh, Pietro, it looks like that's your comment. Do you want to elaborate, unmute yourself and elaborate more on that? Well, sure. I mean, so, you know, as a child, I, I played with Play-Doh. <clears throat> yes, Play-Doh was around even back then. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's a powerful smell. Um, it's a very distinctive smell. And then you grow up, you forget about that smell. And then you have your own children and they start to play with Play-Doh. And the first time you smell it, it's just like, it just brings you immediately back to that moment, you know, as a child. So for me, that's a powerful smell memory. Wow, that is so cool. Who knew that our brains were that, that powerful and um, capable of connecting our other senses to memory. It's just, it blows my mind. And you know- Brains are so weird. They're so weird. So um, I'm going to, uh, finish talking about memory and finish talking about the brain. Um, if you all do have any um, any smells or any other senses that you think um, connect you really fondly to a memory, feel free to drop it in the chat and we'll talk about it later. Um, so um, science has a name for wisdom. All those situations and the information that you've experienced and stored, scientists, brain scientists, not me, um, other scientists who are way more um, familiar with all this stuff. They call it a cognitive template, um, which, you know, makes sense. When it comes down to remembering information, the saying practice makes perfect really does apply. Repetition helps. So practice, practice, practice. Repeating information really works, and so does adding more context. That means stringing a bit, a few bits of information about a person with their name help you to remember it better, um, and these are really strong associations to help um, strengthen memory. And um, you can always pour information into your brain at a slower rate. Um, and so I remember just seeing um, documentaries on Netflix or um, maybe it was YouTube where they were talking about um, people who would just recall numbers or names um, and just like this long list and I remember like the person who was the world champion of it or something she was a woman and she talked about how she made those associations with the brain um, I mean with an with a, a word or a letter or a number in order to help her remember this long string um, of information, which is crazy um, to think about that we can literally train our brains to be able to remember these huge bouts of information. So we've been talking about the brain, we've been talking about the memory. Can you guess where we're going with this week's Citizen Science Project? 
This week, we are talking about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is an irreversible disease. Um, it's a progressive brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills, and eventually our ability to carry out the simplest tasks. And most people with Alzheimer's, the symptoms first appear in their mid-60s. Um, estimates, estimates vary, but um, experts suggest that more than 5.5 million Americans, most of them age 65 or older, may have dementia caused by Alzheimer's. Dementia is the loss of cognitive function. So thinking, remembering, reasoning, um, and the behavioral abilities um, to such an extent that it interferes with a person's daily life and activity. Um, quick little fun fact about me, my grandfather actually had um, Alzheimer's. And it was very interesting um, as, you know, I was a kid, but um, he was, I'm sorry, he's my great grandfather. Um, and when, when I was a kid, I just remember like him, like what's going over to his house and him not really remembering um, who we were. And, you know, like my grandma having to like remake introductions. And it was really funny because I was, um, as it got uh, worse and worse, I was the only person that he would remember, but he never remembered um, my name correctly. And so, you know, as it got worse and worse, he would call me Daisy instead of Deja, which was, you know, I thought it was a cute little nickname because I didn't know any better, but I, you know, just responded to Daisy as well as Deja. Um, but um, thinking about dementia, it is, um, it ranges in severity from the mildest stage when it is just beginning to affect the person's functioning to the most severe stage when a person must depend completely on others for um, the basic activities of daily living. Now, age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's. Above 65, a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's doubles every five years. One in six people over the age of 80 have dementia, and many of them have Alzheimer's. If you have a family history of dementia, like I do, um, this puts you at a greater risk for developing the disease, and it is more common and likely in women. What am I going to do, guys? What am I going to do? Um, worldwide, women outnumber men with dementia two to one. Fingers crossed that um, in my older age, I don't end up getting um, dementia or Alzheimer's. Now, this disease is named after Dr. Lois Alzheimer. In 1906, Dr. Alzheimer noticed changes in the brain tissue of a woman who had died of an unusual mental illness. Her systems included memory, uh, symptoms included memory loss, language problems, and unpredictable behavior. But after she died, he examined her brain and found many abnormal clumps and tangled bundles of fibers. And so these plaques and tangles in the brain are still considered some of the main features of Alzheimer's disease. Um, another feature is the loss of connections between nerve cells or neurons in the brain. And these neurons are the things that transmit messages between different parts of the brain and from the brain to the muscles and the organs in the body. So you can see um, if you know, there is a loss of those connections, you can see how that might be a problem. Now, Alzheimer's can come in a couple different stages, mild, severe, um, mild, moderate, and severe. Now, mild cases include symptoms like memory loss and other cognitive difficulties, such as getting lost, trouble handling money or paying bills, repeating questions. And at moderate stage, individuals have damage to the areas of the brain that control language reasoning, sensory processing, and conscious thoughts. So they have difficulty carrying out multi-step tasks, such as getting dressed, coping with new situations, um, and in the most se severe, um, in the most severe stage of this disease, family members may be completely dependent on others for their care. And currently, unfortunately, there's no cure or treatment for Alzheimer's. Um, and so I don't know about you, but that makes me want to help even more. And we can help with research contributing to the study of Alzheimer's disease through stall catchers. And so this week we are going to be talking about the computerized citizen science project that can be done from the comfort of your home. Today, we have our special guest from stall catchers to talk to us about the project. And so I am going to pass it back over to Caroline to introduce um, or reintroduce Pietro and we're gonna get started with the Q and A session.
Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Deja, for always educating us every week and teaching us new things about the brain. You mentioned the Halloween tie-in. Now I'm thinking of Stallcatcher's zombies. Um, but <laughs> so uh, I was thinking, Pietro, when uh, Deja was talking about the brain, it made me think about um, how when you presented last week and you had the slides about um, I forget exactly how you phrased it, but it was the idea of like people being a network of information in citizen science. Then you also had like kind of how our brain has different neural networks. I'll, I'll pass the mic to you to say this more eloquently, but it'd be great if you could um, talk a little bit about how you got Stallcatcher started um, and then um, maybe like some of the research so far, and then we can dive right into a demo and do a Q&A after if that works for you. Sure, <clears throat> that, that works great, thanks. And Deja, I just wanna say, uh, yeah, that was really a brilliant exposition. I like the way you communicated uh, all that cool stuff about the brain, the brain and the mind, <clears throat> even more than the brain for me is a, is a topic of great interest. So my background is cognitive science, which is the study of thinking. I'm actually not an Alzheimer's researcher and I'm not a biomedical researcher. My science is about how do we build supercomputers out of human brains to process information faster and better than humans can process information or that then machines can process information. So um, it's, it's about kind of like building a global brain or, or some mini global brains that will eventually, we'll connect them all together in the end, I think. Um, don't be afraid. Uh, and so, um, so, so, you know, what you said about the brain is right. It's, as far as we know, it's the most complex information processor in the known universe. Just sit with that for a moment. That thing between your ears is the most powerful computer in the known universe. It's, it's the most complex. You know, you have 100 billion neurons and each one of those has about 10,000 connections on average to all the other neurons in the brain. And today's fastest supercomputers are just now starting to get to process information as fast as the brain. And it takes about 20 million watts of power to power one of those supercomputers. And our tiny little grapefruit-sized brain that's just as powerful takes only 20 watts of power. You know, that's like a it's like a dim little light, you know, or maybe uh, you know, a small computer monitor. That's that's as much power, and yet it's just as powerful as these supercomputers. Evolution, you know, created this amazing thing. So so for me, the opportunity to connect a bunch of human brains together to help solve a problem about the deterioration of the human brain, about Alzheimer's disease, was an amazing opportunity. And there's something kind of poetic about that, right? That we can, we can build a bigger brain by thinking together and use that to conquer this disease. Um, so there was a great opportunity. And, and you know, I think Caroline asked me to talk about also this difference. In, in the way that humans and machines think about things. And, you know, so we're the original kind of neural network. Um, and, and when we created computers, it wasn't, we didn't do it in the first place to build artificial neural networks. You know, maybe you've heard about AI and machine learning and stuff like that. Those are artificial neural networks. We built computers not to think like humans, but to think in the ways that humans don't think very well. You know, so, so Deja told you about how we, you know, we're not very good at remembering things and, uh, and certainly we're not very good with numbers. So we built calculators and today you can go to a dollar store and buy a calculator that can still multiply two numbers faster than any human on the planet, right? That's a very simple computer, but it's not what we were designed to do. We're predictors, right? So we have these models that are good at filling gaps in information. So when Deja's great grandfather um, had a had sort of an uh, an imperfect model of what is Deja's name. There is this, you know, I've got some of the information, day, and I can't quite remember the rest. So I'm going to fill that gap with the only name in my memory that fits the first syllable of day, which was Daisy. It makes perfect sense that that's what he called you, because he was using that powerful computer, which was still relatively intact, and it fit the best name that he could come up with to that first syllable of day. So that makes, that makes great sense to me. And um, so now, yes, we have very fast computers and we think, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could get computers to think more like people than like machines? Because 
then we could get computers to do the same kinds of things people do. And, you know, we've all seen the movies. It's, you know, it's pretty cool and exciting stuff to have a robot that could talk with you, a robot companion. Um, and then there are the scary versions of this, like Terminator, right, where the robots, the AI takes over the world. That's all scary stuff. But I think what we're doing with citizen science is kind of a step in the right direction because we're making humans part of that AI loop. We've got humans and machines thinking together. And as long as we can keep the humans in the driver's seat making the important decisions, we can create these you know, amazing capabilities, these futuristic capabilities and still be in control of how those capabilities are used. Um, I always say to build in a kill switch for the machine too. I mean, just as a backup, right? So I see Deja nodding vigorously. Uh, so, um, so what we did with stall catchers is the, the um, so I live in Ithaca, New York, um, which is where Cornell University is. And I moved here because there are scientists here studying Alzheimer's disease and they're doing research uh, that is looking into a specific aspect of the disease that has to do with brain blood flow. So one of the things we've known since the very beginning of Alzheimer's disease is that Alzheimer's patients have 30% less brain blood flow than healthy people. So what does that mean? So you know that feeling when you're lying down and you get up too quickly and you feel kind of like, whoa, I'm dizzy because I don't have enough oxygen in my brain. That's the level of oxygen that's always in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. And what these Cornell researchers figured out is that it looks like the reason for this is that the very smallest blood vessels in the brain called capillaries are stalling at a higher rate in Alzheimer's patients than they do in healthy people. So that sounds scary. It's like, I'm healthy, so I have these capillaries that are stalling. Well, sh yes, we do. We all do. It's just a natural part of being human. About half a percent of our capillaries are stalled at any given time. But in Alzheimer's patients, about 2% of those capillaries are stalled. And, um, and they figured this out by doing experiments with mice. They actually took mice, genetically gave them the human version of Alzheimer's disease. And then these mice manifest all the physiological symptoms of the disease that Deja mentioned, the tau tangles, the amyloid plaques, they get all that stuff and they start to have cognitive symptoms. The mice lose their memories, they get depressed. You, you, you can measure depression in mice, believe it or not. So then knowing that they had this increased rate of capillary stalling, the Cornell scientists administered a drug to these mice that made those stalls go away. Within hours, literally hours, those mice got their memories back. This was a huge finding. And uh, when I heard about this, I got very excited. And I said, this is, you know, this is amazing research that you're doing. It sounds very promising, you know, but it sounds like you already solved the problem. You got a drug that makes the stalls go away. The mice get their memories back, you know, end of story, problem solved. Um, unfortunately, the drug they gave to the mice that had that effect was, uh, was an immunosuppressant that made the mice vulnerable to any diseases or bacteria. So it was like giving a mouse AIDS. So yes, it made the dementia go away, but they wouldn't survive, you know? So, um, I mean, they didn't continue to give the mice, the, they stopped giving them the mice the drugs. They, they weren't, you know, using this uh, to kill them or anything. Um, so, um, so now the, the, the question, the big question is, is there a drug that can make these stalls go away in the mice without harming them? Or, or where the side effects are not as bad, you know, um, uh, where the benefits outweigh the costs. And, um, and in order to do that, each time they try out a new drug in the mice, somebody has to go in and count all those little tiny blood vessels and figure out which ones are stalled and which ones are flowing. Otherwise, we don't know if the drug's working. If the drug's working, when you go and try to find the stalls, you shouldn't find very many. If it's not working, then you should find a lot. And that's what the stall catchers game is about. This is an, an analysis they used to do in the lab. They used to have three uh, or four laboratory technicians working around the clock, looking at these and trying to figure out if they're flowing or stalled. And, you know, flowing, stalled, flowing, stalled. And we realized that at that pace, it would take six months or a year to analyze the data from a single research question. But then we also realized that you know, you don't really have to be a scientist to know whether a blood vessel is flowing or stalled. Somebody who is taught the basic idea of what these two things look like might be able to learn to tell the difference. And in fact, 
that's where these laboratory tech technicians came from in the first place. They were university undergraduates who were trained by the scientists to do this. So we thought, well, maybe we could create an online game that lets people do this same task of finding these stalls. We'll gamify it. We'll give people a score and a leaderboard and, um, and see if people can learn to do it as well. And, um, and people were doing a pretty good job. Not quite good enough, but we have a bag of tricks. So when we're trying to build these collective brains, what we do is we use something called wisdom of crowds, which you might've heard, heard about before. And the idea there is that if you show five different people the same little blood vessel and you ask them, is this flowing or stalled? And then you average their answers together, that the average answer is actually as good as the scientist answer. Any one person's answer on average might not be, but when you average those answers together, it, it shows an intelligence that's greater or an expertise, I should say, that's greater than any individual member of the group. And we leverage that phenomenon in order to analyze this, the Alzheimer's data. Um, and right now, um, we are analyzing data about five times faster than the Cornell lab and answering these research questions. Um, and I think we're about halfway through the questions that they wanted to have answered to come up with what they call a complete molecular model of what's causing the stalls. Once we have that in place, then I think it's much more straightforward to target a, a safe and effective treatment that would address the stalling um, that's causing some of these symptoms. So did I, co did I cover it? Caroline, I know I spoke you for did. a while. You did. I love that. No, and that, that was perfect because I think we can do a demo for a few minutes and then do some Q&A. And also, I wanted to ask you different questions this time around because um, the questions that Deja and I have are kind of similar to the ones I've asked you for the past five events we've done together. Um, so <laughs> I, I wanted to branch out and try to ask new things. But let's, let's do a demo. Um, I can actually, let me go ahead and share my screen. So I can take us to kind of the pathway that everyone who's on this call would take if they were participating. So let me just share my screen. So, okay, so everybody on this call, no matter who you are, North Carolina or not, and I'm including the person who was unsure if they lived in North Carolina or not in this, this message, um, anybody can come to the NCSU um, page on SciStarter. So SciStarter.org forward slash NCSU dash home and make their SciStarter account. So that's on the left side of the screen. If you all want to follow along, I give you permission to minimize your Zoom windows um, and type it in and make your SciStarter account. Um, and after you do that, so I'm going to log back in because I have a SciStarter account. Um, I could RSVP for future episodes of Make It Count Monday. So if you enjoy hanging out with Deja and I, we're here every week, so you could come out, come and hang out with us again. Um, you, I could do a tutorial. I could look at all these different featured projects here. And Stall Catchers isn't up there yet. We put a request in with our SciStarter development team to add it, but it is on, I believe, no, it's not on that page. So. After you made your NCSU account, you could find Saw Catchers in the SciStarter Project Finder, and then you could click Visit. So you can find Stall Catchers, search it. You have a SciStarter account. If you make your Stall Catchers account with the same email address, hopefully your NCSU email address if you're part of the NCSU community, but as long as you have the same email for your SciStarter and your Stall Catchers accounts, everything will track in your SciStarter dashboard. So that means the number and the frequency of your contributions will track and you'll get some high level statistics about how much awesome citizen science you're doing. Um, so this is the stall catchers interface. And um, I always learn something new each time I do these demos with Pietro. So I think I've leveled up to a point beyond what I'm comfortable with after doing all these events together. But um, Pietro, do you want to describe to us kind of what we're seeing right now? Sure. <clears throat> so uh, we call this interface um, where you see these, these tendrils, uh, the virtual microscope. And it's not our own idea. We actually... Um, borrowed this idea from another citizen science project that began in 2006, if you can believe it, called Stardust at Home. And in that project, they had images of aerogel, which is this very, um, uh, the substance that has, I think, the least density of any known substance. 
and um, a, a spaceship flew the aerogel through the tail of a comet to collect dust from that comet so they could catch particles of that comet dust, bring it back to Earth and analyze it. And so the, the project was all about how do we find those tiny dust particles in the aerogel? They took a million pictures of the aerogel and then they created this virtual microscope interface so people could look through different layers of aerogel and try to find these tracks of, of, of dust. And, uh, and they ended up finding seven of them out of a million images and it changed our understanding of cosmology, of how the universe formed. So it was a pretty amazing project. And the folks who did that project at NASA actually helped us build the stall catchers game. Um, and our very first version of stall catchers, by the way, was taking Alzheimer's data and putting it in Stardust at home just to see if that would work. And it worked well enough. It worked so well that the uh, Cornell scientists decided that it would be easier to analyze their own data using that than the tools they'd been using in their lab. So we knew we were onto something good. So anyway, just a little bit of history. So this is the, this is the virtual microscope. And Caroline, if you could stop that slider from moving automatically, and if you could manually slide it back and forth, that would be great. That allows you to sort of move through, uh, move through time, backward and forward through time, as you look at these tiny little capillaries in the brain of a mouse. So this is a live mouse. What you're seeing is blood flow through the tiny vessels in the mouse brain. And the, the orange outline shows you which vessel you're supposed to be paying attention to. And, um, and so you move that slider to the point where you can see the vessel that kind of lines up with the shape of the outline and then focus on that area and kind of go back and forth manually there. Um, and from that, we can start to decide whether we see motion that's moving in one direction through that vessel or not. So sometimes you just see motion in these, in these videos and it's just noise or random motion uh, it could be due to um, biological movement, heartbeat, breathing of the mouse, that kind of thing. But if you see a bunch of sort of black and white dots moving in one direction through the vessel, that's a pretty good sign that blood is flowing through that vessel. And then you would click on the flowing button. But if you're going back and forth and it's not moving, that would suggest that it's stalled. And then you want to capture that stall by clicking the stalled button. This is definitely flowing. I, I would bet money on the fact that it was flowing. <laughs> I would agree with you. Carol. I'm going to go I, for it. I would not bet against you. <laughs> the expert agrees with me. The vessel is flowing. Wow. And here we've got some community answers down here. So we, we record anytime you answer about a vessel, you have the option to comment on it. So if you, if you, if you answer it's flowing and then you find out it's actually stalled, you might say, well, you know, I don't, this is why I thought it was flowing and you want to describe that. So Caroline's putting a, a comment on here. I would literally bet money on the fact that it's flowing. <laughs> so, so there, that's, that's part of this vessel for all, you know, for all history. Um, yeah, so there is a way to kind of see what other, how other people answered and what the experts answered on, on some of these. You want to do another one, Caroline? Yeah, and I think this one, Deja, I'm going to put you on the spot to do the final verdict for this one. All right, let's go. I think I'm ready. <laughs> yes! Oh my gosh. This is a, sorry, I gave you kind of a tougher one. <laughs> I'll pause it so we can go a little bit slower. So Pietro, wow. in terms of the shape, this is the shape we're looking at, right? That's right. Yep. And you can tell that's the one you're looking at because it sort of follows the shape of the outline. Because, yeah, you can see there are, there are a few blood vessels inside that outline and you want to make sure you're answering about the right one. Yeah. So this this one looks like it has a few different um, it's going in a few different directions. Um, but if I look at that main that main vessel we talked about earlier, it looks like it moves. Oh, wait, reverse, Caroline, reverse for a second, and go forward and backwards. Forward one more time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that it's blowing. I would agree with that. <laughs> I wouldn't bet on this one, but I think we're going to say flowing. Pietro, are you in agreement with Deja? I, I'm in with flowing. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> 
I'm, I'm usually, I'm often not right. Yes, you got it right. That's, that's good. Awesome. Yeah. Yay! So, so I, I feel it's always important to mention that um, people sometimes get quite stressed because they feel like they'll hurt the research if they get it wrong. And our wisdom of crowd methods ensures that the times that you get it wrong, enough other people are getting it right, that, you know, that, that it'll help the research. So we've, we've validated this. We, you can't hurt the research by playing the game. So you can rest assured, you can go in there, do your best. If you get some right, you get some wrong, you're definitely helping the research. So no one should have any concerns about that. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I felt a little bit of that, that pressure when I was uh, on the spot to answer. I'm like, oh no, I don't really want to get this wrong. Like, am I going to guess this correctly? And if I don't, what does that mean? Well, and Deja, isn't that kind of cause, because, so Deja ran a citizen science project called the triangle bird count. And I'm imagining that when you're asking people to participate in a bird count, it's probably pretty precise. And you're like asking a lot of each individual volunteer, right? Like they, they kind of have a responsibility to identify their birds that the birds they see or what, how did you approach that with the triangle bird count? Yeah, so with the Triangle Bird Count, our project was a little bit different where we really had um, a lot of our, we had our, our volunteers needed a high ability to identify birds. So um, if we had people who were considered themselves intermediate or even advanced bird watchers, so able to identify um, the most basic um, 25 birds that we identified by sight, um, they were intermediate. And if they could identify um, those and more by ear, then they were advanced. Um, and if we had um, people who wanted to participate but weren't necessarily sure about bird ID, then they could go out in groups um, and ID birds together. But um, we really, um, it's really just based on what you can identify in the area. And that's what we kind of based our um, based our our study of diversity on got it yeah i it's interesting like different projects kind of i think ask different things of their volunteers like i feel like stall catchers you kind of step people into it like you don't have to necessarily know how to identify a stall before you get started because i know you have kind of those training videos that are more like slam dunks like obvious stalls and people kind of work up to it whereas with like a bird count um, I'm, you, like you mentioned, Deja, you had like the moderate versus advanced controls where I think you could give people varying levels of responsibility, but you probably had to trust them a little bit more. Is that yeah. right? Most yeah. definitely. So cool stuff. Pietro, are you a bird watcher? Do you do, do you bird or not? <laughs> <laughs> I, <clears throat> I, I do like to watch them. I, I don't know them very well. I, I'm kind of, I, I'm fond of raptors uh, and more recently, I think I'm more interested in in bird behavior than identifying species. So, so um, I I was gifted one of these online classes uh, from the the Lab of O, the la uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology about corvids because you know crows and and ravens and and uh, blue jays I think are related to. They're very very intelligent. These are the birds that create their own tools. So you know as a cognitive scientist, I'm fascinated by how other species. Um, are intelligent and how they use tools and things. That's so cool. Yeah, I think our little sidebar here also shows to people in the audience, citizen science is really diverse, you know. It's everything from identifying stalled versus flowing blood vessels to observing birds as part of a bird count. So you really, if you're curious about something, you can be curious about a bunch of different things and take action with all of them with citizen science. Um, let's try one more, and this time we'll have the audience vote in the chat about whether or not this is stalled or flowing. So audience, um, bring back your Zoom windows. If you were playing stall catchers on your own, it's time to tune back in. Is this blood vessel that you see on the screen stalled or flowing? It's always harder for me to identify when it's like kind of more of a perfect oval, which blood vessel it is. Which one is it? Would you say it's this one, Pietro? Uh, that's the one I would think. Yeah. 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 I'm in agreement on that as well. Okay. So what does the chat think? Do you all think it's stalled or flowing? Let's see what the people think. I see one person in the audience says flowing. We have another says flowing. So Caroline, could you, so if, if you see that little um, blue, rectangle there to the right of the green dot that has a number on it that's the movie frames 
Um, so that's a way to sort of talk about wh what position the slider is in. If you can move the slider back a little slowly, um, and yeah, let's stop. Let's stop there. And then if you look at the the bottom of the vessel, there's kind of a darker area there. Yeah, right around there, there's a darker area. And so one of the ways we can sometimes identify a stall is if there's a dark spot that never moves away, that's always kind of in there. That could be a red blood cell that's, or a white, sorry, probably a white blood cell that's stuck and blocking the flow of, uh, of blood. Um, I often get these wrong, <laughs> so, so, um, but, but because if you, if you move the slider back and forth now, just watch that one spot and see if that dark spot ever completely goes away. Ooh, oh no, you've complicated things. I thought this was flowing. So again, that, that's just my take and I could be wrong, but because of that spot, I might think this one was stalled. Does anyone want to change their answer? I know that Deja, you said that the people in the chat said it was flowing. Does anybody think it's stalled now? And maybe Deja, we can let you be the deciding vote. That uh, that dark spot, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go on and, and throw that wild card in there for us. Yeah, I think I have to say stalled. What do you think? Let's let's go with stall that maybe they're trying to maybe they're trying to trick us. <laughs> These sneaky mice. It's flowing. Oh, uh... <laughs> the audience was correct. <laughs> Someone that's, that's caught what you mentioned the crowds, them. right? They said what about the black shadow at the very bottom of the area oh. slides 30 through 38 approximately. Someone got someone saw that as well. Yeah. So, so that, you know, that I think that's a nice example of how there can be disagreement in the crowd, but the majority of people, you know, worked out well in this example, the majority of the people picked the correct answer. Uh, I'm going to have to echo their question from 7, 12, 18. We do have a few examples where we've had um, some of our very experienced catchers um, really call our attention to one of these vessels and say, we think your expert answer is, is wrong. And here's why. And I think in a few cases, we've actually gone back to the experts and said, could you look at this again? Sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll say, yeah, it, we really do think it's stalled and here's why. Uh, but, but I think there have been a couple occasions where they said, yeah, it's really ambiguous. Like maybe that's not a good example because we don't know. So, um, so yeah, you never know. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing now because I think in our last few minutes, we'll do some Q&A. And while people get their questions in the chat, feel free to ask about stall catchers or anything you'd like. But um, I'm going to quickly ask a non-stall catchers question um, because I know that a lot of the folks in the audience are students or um, maybe early career professionals. So I wanted to ask you, Pietro, as you got started in this type of work and you started a citizen science project, what's a piece of advice you've gotten that has stuck with you? Hmm. Piece of advice I've gotten. So I, I, I don't know if this is something that anyone told me uh, along the way, but it's, it's um, you know, Deja was talking about what wisdom is in terms of the brain. Um, it's a piece of, of wisdom, I guess, that came from observing a number of similar patterns, which is where, where wisdom comes from, as she explained. So I saw time and time again <clears throat> that when I had an idea of something I wanted to pursue, that the things that were stopping me from doing it were because I thought I needed permission from someone. Maybe I needed permission from an institution, like, you know, will you support this activity? Um, I needed buy-in from someone. And ultimately I realized that almost all the time, I just needed to give myself permission to do it, you know? And if I didn't have the support of, of sometimes I, I, I just, I somehow thought I needed this kind of support from some other institution to do it when I really didn't. All I had to do was go out and do it. So I think that's been really important. Um, that's what's made it possible for me to start a citizen science project and do some of the work that I do. And I would encourage anyone who is, saying, is thinking to themselves, I'm passionate about this. I want to do this. I think this is a good idea. And other people are saying, eh, you know, we're not going to fund you to do that or, or we don't think that's a good use of your time. You know, listen to your inner voice 
And if you really want to do it, you probably only need permission from yourself. Those are super wise words. Um, and for those of you, if that sparked any follow-up questions, put those in the chat. Um, I know it definitely did for me because um, I'm thinking about how you, you mentioned that you kind of like started this project and like done other work in citizen science, but I've also noticed that you've had such a gift for bringing on strong partners to this work. Um, I know the whole SciStarter team has been really on honored to work with you all, um, but also like the, the partnerships you've brokered with like Microsoft and, you know, with Cornell. So it seems like it's almost a mix of like you being, having the bravery to believe in yourself in this work and then bringing on those partners based on that are, how have you struck that balance between partnership and independent work? Yeah, I, that's a, I think that's a really good point. So yeah, I mean, I would attribute every single one of my successes to other people. Um, and uh, not that I didn't have anything to do with it, but sometimes it really is about picking the right people, right? And, um, and I think there's something to saying, not going to someone and saying, hey, I want to do this thing. Will you help me? But going to someone and saying, hey, I've got this thing. Let me show it to you. You know, I built this or we built this and we're excited about it. And, you know, we want to share in this excitement with you and do something more with it. And so I think it's, again, it's that chicken and egg question. So, you know, I, I'm not going to places like Microsoft and saying, hey, I want to do this thing. Will you help me? I'm saying, we've done this thing. We're doing this thing. Do you want to join and be part of that? It's a very different kind of question and it compels a very different kind of conversation. That's such a good point. Um, and speaking of things that you're doing, do you want to tell the crowd a little bit about dream catchers and what's up uh, next there? Yeah, so <clears throat> so based on, on some of our successes with stall catchers, um, we, um, uh, you know, Microsoft uh, was involved in, in one of our big kind of uh, events that we did with, with SciStarter. And, uh, you know, SciStarter has just been, you know, the, the best collaboration ever. Um, so I'm not just saying that because Caroline's on the line, um, but, um, you know, it almost feels like just an extension of our team. Um, it's, it's a very real, it's a very, uh, I think, synergistic kind of collaboration. And, um, and so we did this huge event we called the Megathon and we were trying to accomplish more analysis of data in a single weekend than we'd ever done before. We want to analyze an entire data set that would take six months to a year in one weekend. And we basically accomplished that. It was pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, but Microsoft um, hosted this event for us and, and they saw how cool this stuff was. And they said, hey, you know, we're trying to do this research on sudden infant death syndrome. Could you do something like stall catchers for that? And uh, so we thought carefully about it and we spun off a platform and, um, and we did a one-off event. So in, in dream catchers, which is what we're calling it, uh, you're looking at a picture of an infant in a sleep environment and you're just trying to decide, is that a, sleep, a, a safe sleep environment uh, or a, a, a high risk sleep environment for an infant? And, and you know, you're taught what those things look like and what they mean when you're onboarded. And, um, and the idea is to you know, help analyze all these data and then eventually you know, teach a machine maybe to do that kind of analysis, um, maybe figure out a way to automate that analysis. So we did that as a one-off event. And the reason we, we didn't do it as an ongoing project is because we didn't have enough pictures of infants in sleep environments. We had, you know, maybe 600. And um, so we analyzed the six, the crowd analyzed the 600 all in that first event and we were done, but we need to analyze a lot more images. They just don't exist. So we had this idea what if we let people upload pictures of their own babies in different sleep environments? People love to show pictures of their babies and they love to hear comments about their babies. So imagine that commenting thing you saw about blood vessels being applied to babies. Oh, your baby's so cute. Where did you get that blanket? You know, you can imagine all kinds of dialogue around babies. Um, and in fact, when we ran our, our event, I know we got to wrap up soon, but when we ran our event for, for dream catchers, we had some of our stall catchers players go over there and it was like they were refusing to come back. They said, we love looking at pictures of babies. It's way more interesting than looking at blood vessels. So eventually they came back as we ran out of data. But um, anyway, we're going to relaunch soon and we're going to have this image upload capability. I think it's going to make a pretty big splash. 
It's fraught with risk, legal risk, ethical risk, all kinds of stuff, but we're taking it a step at a time. We're getting it approved through different ethical review boards and we're gonna to try to do it safely. So um, if you're interested. Yes. Um, yeah. We'll Once it's know. live, we'll add it to the NC State page. Um, but speaking of, let me share my screen to kind of wrap us up. Um, so we wanted to give a plug to the Citizen Science Club. And if, if anyone from the club quickly wants to come in the mic and talk about it, just put that in the chat. But otherwise, you all can find a link to the club's website on the SciStarter NCSU homepage. And the club meets actually on Mondays after these events, I think bi-weekly. So you can follow them on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, and get in touch with them to join. They are the nicest group of people. I love of the NCSU Citizen Science Club, and I'm excited to see what they do with stall catchers. I figured out where stall catchers had been linked. One of the club members actually made a list on SciStarter that we added to the page, and they're stall catchers, but um, our SciStarter development team is moving it up more prominently on this page. So if you made your SciStarter account on that left sidebar, um, I'm going to be emailing out all this info to you. So um, you'll have a link to participate in stall catchers and also be featured more prominently on this page soon. But um, we hope that you all come back and join us next week. Um, I'm really excited. We're going to be doing the Citizen Science Club at NCSU talking to some students um, next week. Um, if not them, then uh, Dr. Cooper and I are also working out something for our 11-2 event. Um, and we have a star-studded cast um, coming up with season, the first season of Making It Count Monday. We got the Wild Sourdough Project. We're going to talk about citizen science and the humanities with Chelsea Krieg, um, a lecturer at NC State, all sorts of different stuff. So we hope to see you again soon. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And um, I just want to say thank you to all the attendees. Um, thank you, Pietro, as always, for your thoughtful answers and your hard work in citizen science. And um, Deja, do you have any final words to wrap us up? Thank you so much for giving us a thoughtful message about the brain to get us started and getting us in the space to think about these big questions. Yeah, no problem. Um, thank you so much, Pietro. I mean, I think I'm hooked now and I, I'm definitely going to participate in stall catchers. And thank you so much for your answers and your words of advice and wisdom. I think um, those are really helpful, especially for early career scientists like myself and I'm sure many other uh, others in the chat. So thank you so much for tuning in and joining us this week. Uh, you're very welcome, Deja, and, and thanks again for having me. I think you're a wonderful science communicator, and um, I think I might pop in and hear some more of your uh, science chats uh, in the future. That come was, back uh, next week. Oh, my gosh. You can come. I, I, you're welcome I learned about anytime. brain freeze. I, I, I never knew what caused brain freeze. So, that yeah, that was a, that was a new one for me. Really cool. To be honest, I didn't either. I think I'm going to get a smoothie now and give myself a like, <laughs> like, <laughs> see in action what Deja described. Yeah, don't try this at home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks this was great.